This is the second video in the Mass Spring Damper video series. In the first video, we introduced the Mass Spring Damper system, generated the cause-effect diagram, and rewrote the second-order ODE into a system of first-order ODEs. In this video, we'll write a MATLAB function to solve the Mass Spring Damper system and run some test cases to illustrate the system's behavior. Without further ado, let's jump into MATLAB to program this system of first-order ODEs. Here we are in MATLAB. I made a new function m file, not a script m file. The function is called mck. It accepts m, c, and k, which are the mass, damping, and spring constants, along with u, which is an anonymous function representing the externally applied force, u of t. Next, it accepts t, which is our time span. t can either be a two element vector containing the start and end times of the time span or a long vector of times containing all the times at which we want to solve the ODE. X0 and V0 are the initial position and velocity, respectively. Finally, options is a special variable which we can use to refine the accuracy of the ODE45 algorithm. We'll get into the options variable a little bit more later on. The first output of the function is TT, which is the output time vector. If T, the input time vector, only contains two elements, the ODE45 algorithm will automatically choose the step size, and those step sizes will be contained in the TT output vector. But if the input vector T has more than two elements, ODE45 is forced to solve the ODE at all points within the T vector, so TT and T will be identical. X and V is the mass's position and velocity, respectively. You can read all this in the pre-written documentation down here. The body of the function itself is actually going to be pretty short. All we really need to do is type in the z dot matrix from the last video and call ODE45. We could alternatively express z dot in matrix form. Use whichever form you prefer. You'll get the same answer no matter what. Now that we have our system of first order ODEs, we can call ODE45. This should be fairly straightforward with one wrinkle. The last input to the ODE45 function call is this options variable. The options variable will control how much accuracy we want the ODE45 function to have. Once again, this will make a lot more sense in just a little bit once we utilize this mck function in our test cases script. The last thing we need to do is parse the outputs. When ODE45 is done, it produces the output time vector tt and a matrix of results z. z will have two columns, one for z1 and one for z2. Recall that when we converted the second order ODE into a system of first order ODEs, we said z1 equals x and z2 equals x dot. Therefore, the first column of the z vector corresponds to the position, and the second column corresponds to the velocity. That's all for the mck function. Part c of the problem wants us to test our function using various parameter values. I prepared a skeleton script to help us. First, we'll explore the effect of changing the damping coefficient, c, without any forcing function. Then, we'll explore the effect of changing the forcing function while holding the damping value constant. I already typed out some parameters to save us some time. We have the initial conditions, the time range, and the system parameters. Note that CVEC contains three different values because we are testing three different C values as specified in the problem statement. One parameter we do need to type out ourselves is the forcing function u of t. 
the mck function we just wrote requires u of t to be an anonymous function. The problem statement says that we need to make u of t equal 0 for part c, so this is pretty straightforward to code. I made this variable u0 to represent a constant magnitude forcing function just for generality. You can play with the completed script on your own and test out different values of u0 to see how the system behaves. Right below u, we have the options variable. The options variable calls the ODE set function with the appropriate name value pairs. In this case, we are going to set both the relative and the absolute tolerances to 1e negative 6 each. Now we need to call the mck function for each c value in the cvec vector, so let's write a for loop. The xc and vc variables are matrices which hold the position and velocities of each test case. Both variables have three rows which correspond to the three test cases. Within the for loop, I called the mck function with the appropriate cvec entry. The first output of the mck function is tt, the time vector generated by ODE45. I chose to ignore it because it will be identical to our input time vector t since the t vector contains all the points at which we want to evaluate the ODE, not just merely the start and end times. I stored the resulting positions and velocities in each row of the xc and vc matrices, respectively. The plot contains the mass's position on the upper subplot and the mass's velocity on the lower subplot. Before we look at any of the curves in depth, we should always check our initial position and velocity. When you're first starting out solving ODEs in MATLAB, it can be difficult to ascertain the correctness of your plots. No matter the complexity of the problem statement or your code, you should always check the initial conditions. If your plot does not display the correct initial conditions, you know for sure that something in your code is wrong. For the position plot, all three curves start at an initial position of 1 meter. For the velocity plot, all three curves start at v equals 0 meters per second. Additionally, if we zoom in really closely at t equals 0 up on the position plot here, it appears as if all three curves have an initial slope of 0. We now know that our initial conditions are correct, so we can check that checkbox. Of course, we can't guarantee that the rest of our plot is right, but something else we can do is qualitatively examine the shape of the curves. The blue curve represents the mass's motion when we have no damping. To reiterate, the purpose of the damper is to dissipate energy from the system. But because there's no damper, aka c equals zero, the amplitudes of the vibrations remain constant over time. This is hopefully reminiscent of the simple harmonic motion plots from the mass spring systems you saw in your intro physics class. Now let's look at the red curve when c equals 8 newton second per meter. We can clearly see the difference between the blue and the red curves. When you introduce damping into the system, the height of each crest gradually decreases because the damper is taking away energy at every point in time. If we mentally extrapolate the trend exhibited by the red curve, we can guess that the mass will eventually stop moving altogether. It will remain at x equals zero indefinitely with no velocity because the damper has transferred out all of the energy. I encourage you to go back into the code and change the final time from t equals 20 seconds to some much bigger number to see if I'm right. Finally, the yellow curve represents the mass's motion when we apply the largest damping value, c equals 40 newton seconds per meters. As expected, a larger c means energy is dissipated faster, so the vibrations die out faster. In fact, there really isn't that much oscillation, it just declines to zero and stays there. 
The key takeaway from this part of the problem is to illustrate the effect of the damper value on the system's position and velocity. When there's no damper, the system is said to be undamped. When c equals 2 times the square root of m times k exactly, the system is said to be critically damped. In our problem, the value c equals 40 corresponds to critical damping. If c is less than 2 times the square root of mk, like here when c equals 8 newton second per meters, the system is said to be underdamped. We didn't do this part, but if c is greater than 2 times the square root of m times k, the system is overdamped. We won't go into more depth about the types of damping in this class, but keep these in the back of your mind for your vibrations class later on. Okay, we have one more part of this problem. In the part we just did, we made the input force u of t equal 0 and tried out three different c values and saw how the position and velocity of the mass behaved. Now we're going to fix the c value but give three different input forcing functions. A constant forcing function, a sinusoidal or harmonic forcing function, and a pulsed forcing function. In the last example, we used a for loop to iterate through each c value, but I think this part is better suited to a switch statement just so we don't generate a whole bunch of plots. I already defined some of the parameters we'll use in the next part of the problem down here, so let's go ahead and write the switch statement. Each case of the switch statement will control what type of forcing function we feed into the mass spring damper system. You can change the type variable to be the string constant, harmonic, or pulsed. The switch statement will automatically select the appropriate forcing function. If we choose the constant forcing function, we can see it on the upper subplot of the newly created figure. When the system undergoes a constant magnitude excitation, the vibrations still eventually die out, but the position settles to around x equals 0.5 meters instead of zero. Now let's see what happens when we apply the harmonic excitation. The harmonic plot is pretty interesting. It takes some time for the system to adjust to the harmonic forcing, but the position and velocity plots eventually mirror the forcing function's periodic nature. Finally, let's do the pulsed forcing. We can see that the step function starts at 10 newtons and becomes zero at 20 seconds. The position and velocity plots also reflect an abrupt shift in behavior at this time, t equals 20 seconds, as well. From t equals 0 to t equals 20, the position plot resembles the constant forcing plot. We see that the amplitude of vibrations decay over time, but it appears that the system will reach a steady state value of around 0.5 meters if we keep the forcing function at 10 newtons indefinitely. But because the input force ends at t equals 20 seconds, the position suddenly drops down but continues oscillating just like before. The difference is now the mass will reach a steady state value of zero, just as we saw in the previous part of the problem. The velocity plot follows a similar trend. This concludes the mass spring damper problem. I hope this gave you a brief but useful introduction to this classic engineering problem. I intentionally wrote the MCK function and this driver script to allow for parameter flexibility. You can change virtually any parameter and the code should work just fine. Please test out different parameters, especially the forcing functions, on your own time to gain familiarity with this code. Just remember to always make the forcing function an anonymous function. You should save this code for your vibrations class because many problems will be similar to this one. See you next time.